what does the city look like from the perspective of a physically disabled person? Could you get to your home in a wheelchair? How has accessibility been taken into account in different parts of the world? Mina Moitaheri, an expert in equality and the rights of persons with disabilities, will be our moderator for the next program. She will interview Ethiopian disability activists Yusef Fekaru and Megdela Tesfaye, accessibility specialist Johanna Hatanen from the Finnish Association of People with Physical Disabilities, and Susanna Halme, an expert by experience in visual impairment. Tervetuloa. In Finland and in Ethiopia, coffee is something that brings people together to chat about everyday events. Uh, welcome to our coffee conversation. My name is Minna Moitahedi and I'll be moderating our event. On stage we have amazing change makers. Josef, the a disability activist and founder of Disability Development Initiative. Susanna, a student and activist for accessibility. Mekdelawit, an architect working at Disability Development Initiative, and Johanna, accessibility specialist at Invalidilito. Each in their own way working towards making the world uh, more inclusive and accessible for persons with disabilities. We invited our Ethiopian partners to share their experiences together with our Finnish colleagues because there is so much that we can learn from each other and how every one of us has something to offer for change. In a moment, we'll get to hear their personal stories. But uh, first, we'll start with a short video that will transport us to the urban landscapes of and bustling traffic of Addis Ababa. <laughs> Seeing the streets of Addis Ababa brings back a lot of memories. I used to visit uh, Ethiopia many times for projects with organizations of persons with disabilities. Uh, the photo you see behind us is from the time I volunteered, to, volunteered at the wheelchair basketball um, training camp to coach. 
Uh, and it was held in a rural town in Ethiopia called Asala, which is also where the famous Ethiopian long-distance runners train. You can see from the photo that the environment is quite challenging for wheelchair users. And you can also see that we're having a lot of fun. One other thing you see from the photo uh, are the people watching us playing wheelchair basketball. So while we're having fun, uh, we're also showing our agency and changing people's perceptions about disability. I learned um, that you can be yourself and go for your goals, figure out how to make it possible. And I also learned about the power of partnerships and working together, um, and that we need pioneers to make the change real. We have an amazing group of pioneers on stage. Yosef, um, you work at uh, Addis Ababa University, and you are the founder and director of Disability Development Initiative. Um, you faced a lot of barriers uh, to get where you are now, and you have a very interesting story from your childhood about going to school. What was that like, and what were your experiences that uh, drove you to where you are now? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Mina, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see an issue from the real life experience perspective, and hence it is my pleasure to share my life experience. I became disabled at early stage of three, and the reason is estimated to be a wrong injection. Since then, I become the burden for my mom, and I am a single parent, grows. Taking me to school and bringing back to home was her primary task every day. And when I get uh, grows to high school, I used to uh, horseback to go back to go to school and back to home. When I joined the university, it became uh, very challenging again, and even more than before, because uh, it was not possible to ride or to use a horseback in university compound, and I don't know any other means of mobility or uh, moving from place to place, so that uh, I, I start to use uh, a walking <coughs> stick which I was using before at my high school for shorter distances, but in the university compound, as you know, it's very wide, and uh, I am unable to go to school to class, class to cafeteria, and vice versa. So it became difficult for me to do it uh, every other day. So thanks to the university management in the student council that time, they got me a wheelchair, and it made me my life easier. I started my work life after my graduation in the same university that I have studied accounting and finance, and I, stra I st uh, struggled to have an accessible environment in the work uh, area, and I found out, I came out with a ramp, which still is using for all at, at the moment. After some years of experience and in the university work, me and my colleagues, make a small group to solve our mobility problem. And this idea grew to today's Disability Development Initiative. And we are proud that we have a Disability Initiative, a Disability Development Initiative, an organization pioneer in uh, working and promoting the accessibility environment for people with disabilities. As an organization, the organization established by five, 35 Mobility challenged people uh, has got benefited more, and 182 pe people with disabilities has been uh, benefited from income generating activity. They become self sufficient by today. We have trained 1,000 uh, more than 1,000 engineers. They are architects, construction building students, urban planners on accessibility. And we are able to uh, survey 231 schools as, as to their accessibility to children with disabilities. Disability Development Initiative became a pioneer uh, promoter of disability in Ethiopia and started to influence the Ethiopian government to have an uh, accessible environment through uh, a newly drafted uh, law of Disability Act of Ethiopia. Accessibility has different uh, sides. 
uh, and it is relative term. One accessible environment may be not accessible for other type of disability. What is accessibility exactly mean this to Nana as uh, a student and a promoter of accessibility? Thank you, Joseph, for sharing your story. For me, as a young woman with visual impairment, accessibility means <coughs> independent living. I live together with my boyfriend and my guide dog. Uh, I am a full-time student at the University of Helsinki. Currently, I'm studying in the master's program of Finnish language and general linguistics. And in my free time, I do a lot of sports, such as swimming, running and goalball. And I also enjoy reading books. For a blind person like me, this all is possible through accessible environment and accessible information. Um, the independence and freedom that Guide Dog offers has been a life-changing experience for me. My guide dog is also here on the stage today with me. Her name is Musa. And with Musa, I'm free to navigate around the university, for example, or I can find some of my favorite cafes, or I can learn the roads to my friends' places so I can visit my friends. Um, but of course, there are sometimes some challenges as well. And the biggest accessibility challenges as a guide dog user in Finland relate to attitudes and lack of knowledge. Sometimes people may start to touch my dog or talk to her when we are walking somewhere. So when the dog is working and they may start to be like, oh, how cute dog. And I, I definitely understand that people mean good, and I really know that she is definitely a cute dog. <laughs> but but this kind of uh, touching or talking to the dog um, when she's wor working can lead even dangerous situation when the dog can't keep the focus on work. And sometimes um, there might be some places that may deny the entrance with the guide dog, um, saying that dogs are not allowed here. So um, I have two things that I feel that make environment more accessible uh, for me as a guide dog user. <coughs> First one is that when you see a working guide dog, let the dog concentrate. And the second one is the, um, please remember that guide dogs are allowed in places that other dogs can't always enter, such as restaurants or cafeterias or shops, because guide dogs are not just normal dogs. They are doing important work. And um, another important aspect of accessibility for me as a student relates to information and learning materials. Uh, as a student, I need to access many course books, exam materials, uh, academic articles, lecture slides. So it is important that these are available in accessible formats, such as audiobooks, braille or digital materials that I can um, use with my screen reader program. Um, but about this team, I do quite a lot of uh, everyday activism in the university, and sometimes I'm struggling still a bit. Um, what I do is that I need to contact the teachers to get their course materials in digital format. And I'm requiring their course book lists beforehand so that I have enough time to um, order audio or digital books in time. And I feel that sometimes it might be a bit difficult to move away from the traditional, um, for me, inaccessible uh, solutions of sharing, uh, for example, printed handouts during the classes or, or uh, making last minute changes for course literature or changing the exam books. And for example, showing the PowerPoint slides and saying, okay, I'm not going this all through because you can see it on the slide. So this type of things I'm, I'm kind of promoting in the university 
So I would say that my way of promoting accessibility is pretty much through small uh, things in everyday life. Uh, when I go around with my guide dog and when I do my studies, I try to raise awareness and change attitudes towards more accessible and inclusive world. So we disability activists are making a difference, um, but we don't do this alone. We need architects to make sure that the plans and designs are accessible. So Meg Delavit, you're an architect and you work with Josef on um, training design and construction <coughs> professionals and making schools more accessible for children with disabilities. Um, can you tell that why and how did you focus on accessibility projects and what kind of barriers do you observe and how are you making a change? Okay, uh, thank you Susanna for a great introduction. And hi everyone, my name is Magda Leitesfei and I'm professional in architect and currently employed in an organization that Yosef uh, introduced to well. And uh, our major projects are accessibility trainings, accessibility audits and accessibility uh, tr um, renovation works. So in my experience as an architect student in the university, we don't see, we don't usually see students who are disabled and that is a reflection of how persons with disabilities are not exposed and on an equal basis to education like others and also the physical environment is not that welcoming and usable independently. So uh, in collaboration with Invalidilito, what we do in uh, Ethiopia is train the architecture students in the university called EIBC, Ethiopian Institution of Architecture and Building Construction. So what we do is train the students and give them introduction about what disability is, what accessibility is, because it was not common to uh, focus on accessibility in our education system. So we introduce them those topics to the graduates so they can have a little bit of awareness when they go to the profession to understand what persons with disabilities need from the built environment. So, in fact, in 2018, uh, I was one of the participants of the training that DDI hosts, hosts and uh, it was really an eye-opening experience for me because I did not know what accessibility was, I just was trained professionally to be an architect. So, it opened my eyes what persons with disabilities need from the built environment. And uh, the other major work we do is uh, in collaboration also with Invalidelito, we do accessibility audits and renovation with a method adapted from SK. So we understand what the environment is and what it lacks and what can be done uh, with um, minimal requirements or um, to just allow the students to come to the school. So we have done a renovation in 2022 and uh, it's located in Addis Ababa. It's called Dilbetagel Primary School. So our intervention area is around the kindergarten area. So the school was fully inaccessible. So we aim for the students to come to the school because uh, the experience is persons like children with disabilities in the area will just be in, the, in their home because they cannot come to the school and if they have to come to the school and if they manage to the, come to the school, they will be helped by their peers, like carried by their peers and uh, uh, helped a lot with that because that, that's not a human thing to do and education is like uh, a human right for children. So uh, the, the environment does not support that. So what we aim is to allow the students to come to the school and use the different facilities. So we have created uh, an accessible pathway that connects the entrance to the different facilities like the dining halls, the um, toilets, classrooms. So we can see like in the coming year, like in September, we would have students to the, coming to the school and uh, moving around independently. So that's a big uh, achievement for us and the, par the parents would be able to go to work without worrying about their children. So we hope this project is, will come a pilot project and an exemplary project to motivate other organizations to work on these uh, kind of projects. And we're also, hope this project will not be the end of what we do. And 
Uh, Susan, Johanna, like uh, our in cooperation with Invalidito has been productive. Uh, so, uh, could you tell us a little bit about what uh, you do in Finland? You're also an architect, so and also explain what changes have you seen here? Yeah, sure. Hey, thank you, Mekdelavi, and how you all there in audience. Uh, in my work as an accessibility specialist in Invalidito, uh, my goal is together, of course, with my team to promote a realization of the wide-ranging accessibility in our society. And as you asked how we are doing it, this promote this huge goal, is that um, we share information and uh, um, advices through various channels. Uh, we arrange different kinds of courses and trainings. And um, we consult on accessibility, for example, in different kinds of planning and building processes and projects. And as our colleagues in Ethiopia as well, we are carrying out also these kind of accessibility audits. And I feel that through of my work, I've been able to see from like front row side, uh, like seat, uh, how this accessibility has um, developing in Finland past 15 years. And although there is still a lot to be done for sure, I think we have also made some progress during these years. Uh, and, and this cooperation with Ethiopian partners has been really rewarding and instructive. And this cooperation has helped us to see how much we have, despite all our differences, how much we have also common challenges in um, promoting accessibility. So this common habit of having a lot of coffee and drinking a lot of coffee is not the only common thing we share. <laughs> Um, although our legislation uh, in Finland is already at the fairly uh, good level, we could say, there is still a lot to be work to be done by in our attitudes. In Finland there is still too much, or as I see it, uh, too much focus on implementing the minimum dimensions according to the regulations, instead of the thought that accessibility and this kind of design for all thinking should be the base and background in every design we make. And yeah, we could maybe also say that in Finland, accessibility is still, at least quite often, something what is added uh, to plans when everything else is already like done. Um, and uh, so first, uh, planning something which is not suitable for us all, and then we start to fix it by some uh, um, special solutions that everyone could cope and. Uh, survive maybe even in their everyday life and in common surroundings and environments. Um, I think that we should move on from the thinking of coping and survival and ask how equality is actually realized. Do we all have the same opportunities to make decisions uh, and choices about our own lives? Uh, or do we have equal opportunities for different experiences? And about these experiences, and about a topic uh, which I'm personally really excited about is the work we've been recently doing past these crazy corona years. Uh, we've, been, we've been promoting in, in Validlito the accessibility of nature trails and nature destinations. And that's why the picture here, <laughs> that we've been a lot of in forests lately. And um, in Finland, uh, maybe we could say that exercise in nature is general, generally considered uh, as an important basic right. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, nowadays, uh, at the moment, it's not happening equality for us, us all. So we, uh, so we all don't have the same opportunities to go and explore and have those um, experiences in nature. And that's a pity, because in Finland, actually, we have a really comprehensive network of different kinds of nature trails, roads, destinations, which could be also like they is today, like uh, completely suitable also for people who move or, or act different ways. But the only problem is actually that uh, the insufficient uh, information the, the inf uh, we get like pre beforehand, that we don't have the information uh, from those roads and destinations. And uh, that could be a big obstacle uh, like accessibility obstacle as those if the routes and destinations would be themselves like unaccessible. So lack of information is the big issue nowadays in Finland. So in addition to making our environment more accessible and equal for everyone, in the future 
it is also really important and actually crucial also to communicate the current state of our environment. With the help of available information, each of us can decide for ourselves uh, whether the destination or target or thing or whatever it is in question uh, is suitable for us or not. And then they can make their own decisions if they want to go there or not. So, me and I, and I we met actually first time 2013 when I started to work in the same organization than Mina. And uh, actually Mina's work and especially her attitude has always been a great source of inspiration for me. Mina has worked in many uh, different positions, also in the inter international field, and has shown that expertise and know-how matter more than, for example, the way you happen to move or act. So, Mina, you've worked globally to promote rights of persons with disabilities. What is the main message you heard today? Thank you, Johanna, for your kind words. So, the main message is that accessibility is a human right. And we heard concrete, excellent concrete examples. Josef told us about how he founded an organization to promote equality and accessibility for persons with disabilities. Susanna told us about uh, her everyday activism for accessibility for students with visual impairments. From Magdalawit, we learned about how she's educating architects uh, and improving attitudes uh, about accessibility. Uh, and Johanna told us how, um, you know, accessibility is about making choices possible and, and changing attitudes so that, you know, we have choices to do what, what we want to do, wherever we want to do that. Uh, accessibility is also a requirement to be able to access other human rights. So accessibility makes it possible for me to, to study, to work, to hang out with my friends in a cafe, to do sports, basically to do what the same thing everybody else does too. And it's about all of us being able to participate equally and making it possible for you to make your, your contribution in whatever it is you're passionate about. But there's still so much more to do for a truly inclusive and accessible uh, society. Everyone can take action. So please take what you learned uh, with you today, and um, even small actions can make everybody an ambassador for accessibility. Thank you for being here listening to us, and thank you to our uh, pioneers and change makers for all the work you do and continue to do. Thank you. Thank you.